day on Call Out, Whistler Sorrow races into the backcountry to rescue a severely injured pro snowmobiler. You guys are going to need to keep your eyes open, okay? Just keep talking to us. And later, searching for subjects in the Chequemus River. Okay, it looks like uh, code four, but can you uh, join the RCMP with your gear and hook her down there when we come back on? Saturday, 11.30 a.m. Whistler SAR members Gavin Christie and Binti Massey are out for an afternoon of recreational snowmobiling when they receive an urgent page from SAR base. We looked at the page, it said a broken femur, urgent Brandywine area. Binti and I looked at each other and knew right then our day was over. We called into SAR base to get some more details on what the mission was. Chris Brown, a Whistler local, has crashed into a tree while performing a challenging stunt for an extreme snowmobile video. He's seriously injured and in need of evacuation from Brandywine Meadows. With our knowledge of the area, knowing there's only two routes to the Alpine out of Brandywine, we quickly surveyed our area that we were in and checked with the other groups of snowmobilers right in our area that everyone was okay. At that time, we assumed that it was gonna be Brandywine Bowl. They race off to Brandywine Bowl, an eight kilometer sled ride through the backcountry. 15 minutes later, they arrive on scene. You saw a large group of people with film equipment scattered around, snowmobiles halfway up the slope. We assumed that this was our location and our subject would be found at the bottom of the cliff. Further up the hill, sandwiched between a large fir tree and a 20 meter cliff face lies Chris Brown his snowmobile sticking straight up out of the snow beside him. Earlier that day, Chris Brown and another pro big mountain rider had been performing some daring stunts for a film production crew. Big jumps and even bigger drops were making for some spectacular footage. But when Chris attempted a near vertical double drop between large fir trees off the 20 meter cliff, Something went seriously wrong. Uh oh. Whoa! Chris's friends rushed to his side and soon realized the severity of the accident. Oh, oh. Yeah. I'm really bad, dude. My back is broken. My pelvis is broken. Stuff. Need a, need a heli very fast. 12.05 p.m. A rescue helicopter takes off from Whistler Heliport and heads to Callahan Country Resort to pick up search manager Brad Sills, then to the Olympic Park to pick up Nordic ski patroller Tavo Martin. Understanding the immediacy of the medical response, we called upon Whistler Olympic Park, uh, the closest uh, facility with first aid attendants to respond to the accident scene. Back at Brandywine Bowl, Binti heads up to assess the subject, while Gavin remains down below to clear sleds and equipment and prepare for the rescue helicopter which is due to arrive within minutes. It's important to have a clear area for the helicopter to land, as well as a reference point for the pilot to see. As he comes into land with all that fresh powder, he basically creates his own whiteout, and without a reference, he can easily flip the helicopter and crash. There was people helping, lots of people to help, so I tried to delegate some people to help dig out a platform for a stretcher, because I knew we were gonna have to do that right away. We got his helmet off. You could see that he was really broken up and that his pelvis was definitely broken. His leg was broken, his ankle was broken. He didn't seem to sustain any head injury or neck injury, which is good, but you never know that because you break your pelvis and I think that kind of pain is so intense that you won't feel anything wrong with your head or your neck and the, you know, your other extremities. Vinti was by my side the whole time. He took my vitals and he assessed me and I just kept asking for painkillers. That's all I wanted. I was shaking and freezing, but I, I just said, hey, can someone get me some painkillers? 
but he couldn't administer anything because he's not a doctor and it could affect me when I got to the hospital. Binti does his best to keep Chris calm, reassuring him that help is on the way. It's painful to watch and that you really can't do much and you do need to move him. And moving someone like that who's that broken up without medication is, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to do. Twice, actually, I remember someone saying, the hell is here, I hear it, I hear it. And I was just like, oh, thank God. Moments later, Brad and Tavo set down in the landing zone. Way up behind the top, top tree, they've cut a stairway up there, and uh, Binti's calling the pain 10 out of 10 on him. Okay, so... Tavo, you want to go up and do primary? So arriving on scene, um, I dispatched the first aid attendant to, to attend to the subject along with Binti. The subject was in a lot of pain. Uh, there was a lot of screaming and a lot of anxiety by everybody attending to the scene. Feeling otherwise, do you have any pain anywhere else? I wanted to close my eyes and go to sleep and kind of forget about it all because I was in excruciating pain. And I knew it wasn't going to be a quick exit out of there. Chris, I'm going to need you to keep your eyes open, okay? Just keep talking to us. I don't want to talk. You don't want to talk? Okay. He was in shock, and shock is a killer. And he started to get quiet on us. And, uh, you know, it's almost better to have him screaming his head off than, uh, than go dead quiet. At some point, I wasn't sure if I was going to die from bleeding internally. I knew my other injuries weren't going to kill me, but I thought the bleeding could. I could feel it was getting worse. It was starting to fill my, my abdomen. All I could think about was my family, my girlfriend, my two daughters that I needed to take care of. So whatever happens, I'm going to live. So dying's not an option. Uh, hey, Brad, uh, we're just getting ready to put our subject onto the backboard, and well, looks like we'll be moving downhill soon. Uh, Benti's inquiring, is the chopper prepped? Yep, we're not going to go over that again here now. Yeah, copy. As we were attending to Chris Brown, there was quite a danger of snowfall coming down, avalanches, or a further deadfall coming down from the tree that he had just hit with a snowmobile. It was always in the back of our minds we knew we had to get Chris out of there. Just getting him on the board now. Getting the backboard under me and getting me strapped into it was a nightmare. <laughs> the pain was unbearable. And I, you know, just moving me at all, I could feel every bone grinding every time they moved me. I was trying not to yell, but I was just like, keep me level. <laughs> Chris is slowly carried down the steep slope. The film crew works ahead to widen the switchback trail to allow for a smooth descent. How you doing, Chris? That was a huge bonus to have a lot of manpower. Digging that whole pathway back down to the flats and to the helicopter was awesome. I just remember being in the helicopters. I don't remember talking. People were taking my vitals. Oh. I just kept begging for painkillers. That's all I remember. Tavo escorts Chris to the Whistler heliport, where an ambulance will take him to the local hospital. It's over, just like that. And then we all just look around like, oh my god, what just happened? That was, uh, that was a nasty one. So this is the day. It's now 10 feet in 10 days, where we ride. There's massive mountains here. No tracks for, as far as you can see, you won't see tracks. It all started with a film crew in Whistler to shoot an extreme snowmobile action movie. Chris, having starred in several snowmobile videos, was eager to be featured. The increased profile would keep his sponsors happy and attract business to his company, ridewithchrisbrown.com. Jeff and I arranged to go with the filmers and we figured we could bang out two segments each in two, in two days. That was the goal. Extreme snowmobile films feature big name riders performing seemingly impossible stunts with relative ease. 
audiences are taken along for the ride in fast-paced, adrenaline-fueled sequences. One guy, say Jeff, would do a huge drop or a big line somewhere, and I'd want to one-up him, so I'd do something gnarlier. And this is kind of how it works. You feed off each other. Like you definitely want to see each other push it. You know, you're kind of scaring yourself because you know you're pushing the envelope, you're on the edge, but you know you're in control at the same time. Backcountry athletes like that, that step it up and constantly think that they're gonna step it up a little bit more, a little bit more, and it's not the same. They need to go a little bit higher, a little bit further, and their sponsor's expected, and they're being filmed, and you know, having a camera on you pushes you beyond your level. Yeah, things can go wrong. There are obvious risks associated with the sport, such as being caught in avalanches or falling into hidden crevasses and tree wells. But pro snowmobilers have years of experience under their belts. I know it doesn't seem like we're safe, the things that the lines are doing and the jumps and the cliffs, but to us it's safe because we've done it so many times. I would compare it to Formula One racing or any kind of racing where you're going fast, where you don't just hop in a, in a fast car and do laps and win races. You start slow, you start on little tracks, and you start in slower cars and you work way, your way up. We don't just jump on turbo snowmobiles and jump off huge cliffs. We definitely started with little mellow slopes, little jumps, and we've worked our way up. But a guy driving a Formula One race car is definitely on the edge, just like we are. If he's not pushing the envelope, he's not gonna win. And we're not trying to win or anything, but that's part of the fun. I don't think every race car driver is doing it just to win. I think they do it because it gets their adrenaline pumping. Even so, professional snowmobilers ride a fine line when performing many of these stunts. With the experience that I've garnered over 35 years in search and rescue is that, you know, if you live that close to the edge, eventually you're going to fall off. There was a cliff I had done the year before. I figured I could do it again, and we'd get different angles on it, make it look better. I went about 120, 125 feet or so on it this year. I disappeared into the powder on the landing, and then came out and bounced and landed, and I was stoked. All right, what's next? Now what can I do? Didn't feel a thing. <laughs> I'm looking up the hill, and I see a double, maybe a triple line even, where it's like drop one, and then drop a bigger one, and then a bigger one all in a line. Chris rides to the top of the hill to assess the terrain and determine whether or not he can pull off the stunt. Both filmers had set up for me to do it. They, so they kind of assumed I was going to do it. And they said, are you going to do it, Brown? Are you, going to, you think you're going to do it? I said, well, I'm 70%. Well, no pressure or anything. You, know, don't, you don't have to do it. But if you did it, it would be the sickest shot of the year. So I said, OK, I'll do it. And I'm not blaming anybody but myself for any of this. Yeah, buddy. I told the filmers I was, I was doing it, so be ready. And as I was coming down to the first one, I, I said, OK, go slower, go slower, go slower. And I just I kind of held the brake slot and slid down the first one and landed quite a bit shorter, maybe 10 feet shorter than I had planned. Snow came over my head because it was so deep and it stuck to my goggles and then I bounced. Snow came over my head again and I immediately went off the next one and the snow cleared my goggles and all I see is this massive Douglas fir tree right in front of me and I came down the tree breaking all these huge limbs with my body and then I ended up in, this, in the tree well head first on my back with snow in my helmet and I can't see and I can't breathe. So I'm pushing snow up to get an air path, and finally I broke through, pulled the snow out of my helmet, and was able to breathe. And I just tried to push my head up, and I said, oh no, my back's broken. And then I tried to twist, and my pelvis, my pelvis just twisted like this. And then I tried to push off my feet, and it felt like my foot was backwards. And I can feel a warm, like burning sensation in my abdomen. And at that point, I knew I was really hurt. I'm bleeding internally. I can feel it. 
Luckily for Chris, his friends and colleagues were close by and able to call search and rescue. Safe in hospital, Chris has a long road to recovery ahead of him. Now it's been seven months. I'm lucky I'm alive. I feel like my recovery's way ahead of where it could be. You know, the doctors told me it'd be years before I did anything, but I'm hiking, I'm biking, I'm gonna be riding my snowmobile in a couple months. I'm not gonna be doing big, huge cliffs anymore. I don't need to. That's over. Th that, this, this definitely uh, taught me a lesson, for sure. Now, searching for subjects in the Chequemus River. You want to be positive, but we really know in, in our hearts that it's not going to be a good outcome. Saturday, 2.40 p.m. It's late summer, and Whistler Search and Rescue was called out to the Chequemus River, where two people were seen being swept into the fast-flowing water. Gavin Christie, a certified swift water rescue technician is tasked to drive the Whistler SAR truck to the river, but there's a problem. Probably been six weeks without a call and we're not practicing during the summertime, so when I showed up to the SAR base and hopped into the truck, I turned the keys and nothing happened. Dead battery. So I quickly unloaded some gear and put it into my personal vehicle and use that to drive down to the scene. Search and rescue from search and rescue Gavin is joined by SAR manager Darren Romano, and they head south towards the Chequemus River, about a 20-minute drive from Whistler. While en route, they receive a discouraging update from Squamish Search and Rescue, who are already on scene. Looks like, okay, looks like uh, code four, but can you uh, join the RCMP with your gear? They informed me that they had found one person uh, kind of laying in a little bit of water and not moving at all. It's tough. You don't want to get too pessimistic going into it because you'll start thinking negatively and that can impact your performance. So you, you want to be positive. But we really know in, in our hearts that it's not going to be a good outcome. Squamish SAR has called in a helicopter equipped with a long line to assist in the recovery of the deceased subject. Also on scene is veteran Whistler search manager Brad Sills, who consults with Darren on the challenges of this mission. Another helicopter has arrived to help search for the second subject, and they dispatch a team to fly down the river from the point last seen. We searched with the helicopter over the uh, river. We also had people searching on the side of the river to see if the other subject had a chance to get ashore safely. So many places somebody can hang up in here. After several hours of aerial searching up and down the river, both the helicopter and ground SAR members who have been scouring the banks are instructed to stand down for the day. The next morning, we started flying the river again early morning because we'd have a, a different angle of light into the water and we we're hoping that we might be able to see into places that we couldn't before because of the glare off the water. When you're helicopter searching, you can adjust the rotor pitch such that it blows the bush back from the shoreline and it gives you a very good vantage point up onto the shoreline. One of the dangerous things about doing a river search of that nature, and we're so close to the water, if there was any mechanical issues with the helicopter, the pilot doesn't even have time to warn you that something's going wrong because he's got his hands full. There's thick bush on either side. There's no hope of him being able to go to a safe spot. It's going to be parked in the river. That'd be a good one for the, the boys in the kayaks to search. Yeah. When the helicopter search team comes upon a catchment that could potentially trap a body underwater, swift water technicians are transported by helicopter to take a closer look. We insert the kayaks by long line and set the paddlers down as close as we can to their kayaks. Here in British Columbia, our rivers tend to be very fast moving white water and very, very cold. It's simply not feasible for searchers to sweep the entire length of the river on kayaks and catarafts. Our subjects 
tend to get hung up in, in, in wood and in eddies and backwaters and that sort of thing. And basically that's why most subjects that are lost in rivers around here are never found. Colin's keeping a lot of stuff in. Yeah, this is, uh, we were looking at this a lot yesterday. You could definitely be under there. Oh, yeah. As they progress downriver towards Daisy Lake, it becomes nearly impossible to see through the water. The river uh, turns into class five white water and uh, the surface is completely white for the entire seven kilometer stretch. It really turns into a raging rapid here. After six hours of intensive searching on day two, SAR managers decide to suspend the search indefinitely. Winding up a swift water call is often very difficult because unlike land searches, the chance of survivability is typically far less. And so the outcome is usually not very gratifying. Unfortunately, our best efforts came up dry and the subject has still not been recovered. We just have to live with that. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.